all of you for taking the time uh, by joining us so we can learn more about these three amazing individuals that we are going to learn from. In addition, I also want to thank the panel for taking the time to be a part of this event. Uh, one thing to mention is that, uh, as originally had planned, Monique is unable to join us tonight, but we do have Rebecca Wong here, who is also a, a part of the Board of Directors, uh, joining us tonight. Some ground rules I do want to mention is that to make sure that the event runs smoothly, I ask you to refrain from unmuting yourself until the Q&A portion at the end, and there will be a Q&A section at the end for you all to ask your questions. Uh, that being said, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to add them in the chat or unmute yourself at the end to ask our wonderful panel. So to start us off, I would like to go through some inter introductions. Um, that includes your name, your position, what you do. You can also include what you are currently studying. And if you are involved in any other activities or organizations, that would be wonderful to mention. And I will have Yvette and then Diana and then Rebecca uh, go in that order, if that is okay with you all. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. My name is Yvette Perrion. I am the chair of the Education Inner Club Council. So, um, I am a fourth year English major um, and I am planning to uh, apply to the single subject credential program here at Cal State Fullerton. So my position entails, as I am the chair of the Education Inner Club Council, I am the liaison between the College of Education and students and club representatives underneath the College of Education, just so you guys are aware of who and what the Education Inner Club Council does. So we serve current and prospective and prerequisite students in the College of Education as a funding body from ASI, meaning that uh, we help fund student um, events, um, College of Education events, and everything of that nature. And we help fund travel to education conferences and research. Hello everyone, my name is Diana Lopez and I serve as the staff advisor. I'm the assistant dean for student affairs for the College of Education. So I pretty much um, just partnership with the EICC and providing you know, staff and faculty guidance and mentorship. I provide student leadership uh, development as well. And um, my role primarily is to allow the students to run this um, EICC it's student run. I try to really just um, take a step back and take a hands-off approach, but I'm there to provide support. I'm there to provide accountability. I attend the meetings and, um, and I provide that mentorship as well. Um, I am studying right now. I'm going to school. I'm working on my doctorate. Um, I just started that this fall, so I am in the trenches like all of you. Going through school during COVID-19 is not easy at all, so I totally understand. I, <laughs> I'm there with all of you. Um, so yeah, so I am a student as well, full-time, and, and that's going really well. Um, I forgot to mention my preferred pronouns. They're she, her, hers, and ella. Um, and I've been with Cal State Fullerton for almost five years now. I've been in student affairs for 12 years, uh, but with, uh, with, this, with Cal State Fullerton for almost five years. And it's been a wonderful experience. And it's been a great experience serving as the EICC staff advisor as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca. Um, I'm one of the co-directors for the uh, Board of Directors for the College of Education. I am filling in for Monique spot uh, because she is on flight right now. She cannot make it. Um, but just a little bit about me. I'm a fourth year. I'm majoring in history because I plan on teaching high school history and of course applying to our amazing credential program that we have here. Um, just like all of you guys, I'm super passionate about education and just making a difference in the world and making an impact on other students' lives. So just a little bit about the Board of Directors. Um, we really focus on passing and writing proposals and resolutions. We do a lot of the big voting when it comes down to funding and um, 
budgets and other things that go through the school that have to deal with you. Uh, we deal with the big, the big guys at the school, basically. Um, but the most important thing we do is advocate for you and become your guys' voice. So anything that you guys need to be heard on, um, we're here to just be there for you and be your voice and um, make the changes that we need. Awesome. Uh, so just to go more into detail, uh, how did you guys end up in this role to provide some context for our listeners and how uh, they can get involved with EICC, the Education Interclub Council or ASI Associated Students Inc. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm sure it may pique some interest for our future potential board of directors or EICC uh, board members out there. Um, that would be definitely interesting to know. Okay, hi, um, hi um, I'm Yvette, the chair again. Um, I forgot to state my pronouns. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, so how I ended up in the role of the Education Interclub Council chair is that I first um, found out about the Education Interclub Council during spring 20, um, during fall 2017. So that was my first semester at Cal State Fullerton. I was taking a um, teaching exploration class by Dr. Ambrosetti. Um, it was EdSec 110, and that's where um, one of the ex-board of directors uh, came into our class and promoted um, some positions in the Education Interclub Council, as not all of the positions were filled during that time. So from there, um, I started out as the director of event planning, and then um, one year later, I became the chair for the Education Interclub Council, and I have been the chair for about two and a half years. And then, oh, um, the second question is, how can you get involved with the Education Interclub Council? Um, one of the perks of being in the, um, in the position or in um, the Education Interclub Council um, board is that there is a little bit of a leadership award that goes with the position as well as it does go on your resume as well. It's also a big plus that Diana, who is Director of Student Affairs, is our um, advisor. So she's always there to help you out as well. Um, we do have open positions coming up. I don't know if you guys are going to stay in the College of Education, but positions um, for the executive board open up um, in the spring. So those are applications for the next coming um, academic year. So academic year 2021 to 2020. So for me, as um, in my role, I like I mentioned, I've been in student affairs for 12 years now. Um, didn't start off in student affairs, actually started off in immigration law. I thought I was going to go into becoming, um, making a difference in, in immigration in that field. Um, and it just didn't work out that way. I ended up realizing that wasn't not immigration, but law wasn't really my passion to pursue, and education was always kind of in back of my mind, supporting uh, students at the college uh, age level. And so I decided to take a year off from from work and kind of do some just self exploration and try to figure out like what is it that I want to do when I grow up. And I started off 12 years ago as a front desk receptionist. I already had my bachelor's degree. I didn't have my master's. And um, five promotions later, now I serve as the assistant dean for student affairs. And so it just took blood, sweat, and tears. Took a lot of, um, you know, just I'm a first gen, uh, first generation student. I'm also first generation professional in my family. So it took a lot of navigating, you know, the whole college experience, navigating what it is to be in a white collar profession all on my own um, with the support of my family cheering me on. But um, it, it really took breaking glass ceilings as a, you know, as a woman, Latina. Um, and so I, you know, moved up and I knew I always wanted to work supporting um, students. And um, my, I have a master's in organization leadership um, with an emphasis in leadership development and conflict management. So the, that educational background along with my experience being a former academic advisor director, being a former admissions director, um, working um, as an advisor, 
uh, doing student admissions and now doing you know student affairs leadership um, just really prepared me to be in this role and be able to support students who want to be leaders who want to make a difference in their, their current role as a student um, and so it just you know it ended up that this position just had that already embedded in the job description so it worked out really well for me um, and so I, I enjoy doing what I'm doing, um, working with our EICC leaders because all of them bring such unique talents and skills that really just take things to the next level. And I have to say that this group of students are really doing things that has never been done before. So I, I'm really um, encouraged to be with, to be there alongside with them and be a partner in all of the work. Um, I forgot to mention my pronouns too, but I go by she, her, hers. Um, so the way I got this position is actually a little different than it originally goes. Originally you apply and you can meet the qualifications and you go to the college and get elected. Um, before someone had stepped down from this position. So when someone steps down, then the new person who's filling in gets appointed. So I saw that someone uh, stepped down from the position and I was like, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna apply for it. So I did and I went through a really big interview process and how to create a presentation of uh, why I think I'd be best fit for this position. I got interviewed uh, by a couple different committees a good three times and then now I'm here. And I actually just recently um, got this position like a month and a half ago and I uh, was just going through training and all of that so if you are feeling like you really are passionate about our college and you just want to make a difference and um, sit up there with big guys and really advocate for our college and for our students and really um, help other students get involved then I definitely would recommend this position. Awesome good tips definitely for those who are interested Look out for those uh, that information in the spring. Uh, the next question that I want to ask are, what are some potential services and resources that students, you all, in the College of Education should know about, uh, especially during this time? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the Education Interclub Council provides funding for students in the College of Education. What I mean by funding is that um, sometimes there are programs or if any of you all are interested in any uh, teaching related conference that there's um, a registration fee it doesn't matter how much it is the, the education interclub council is able to reimburse you for that conference so it's a very good thing also during this time since everything is online it may be easier for you all to go to online conferences compared to in person so we are able to reimburse you for the application fees so just so you all know um, funding um, does come from somewhere, it comes from ASI. So ASI, just so you're aware of, of how um, interclub councils get their funding, is that a little bit of money gets taken away from you, from your, um, from your fees to go to school at Cal State Fullerton. So it's just a little bit from each um, student's um, fees and they are dispersed through all the inner club councils on campus so college of education has the education inner club council and for example the college of humanities has their own inner club council so that's how we are able to support students throughout the campus um, just so you're aware of how funding works so funding or reimbursement um, you must contact the Education Interclub Council before the event takes place. That is how we make sure you get all the right paperwork turned in and you are aware of how the process goes to be able to be reimbursed for that event. So um, my role as Assistant Dean is kind of unique in the sense that, you know, when you think of a dean, you think of more like an academic dean, the dean that oversees a college which the Dean for our College of Ed is Dr. Lisa Kirkman. Um, my role is a position that was created primarily to support students. Um, the way I like to explain it is I'm a, like the main resource hub for our, for our students in the college and students who are taking prerequisite courses um, with us. And, you know, I still like people ask, what does a Dean do? Like, 
my my parents they say like they tell people my daughter's a principal even though like that has nothing to do with higher ed that's k through 12. but people still try to like they're still confused with what like a dean position is um my primarily role is to be here for the students is to support them i like to explain it like your student success is a priority but so is your well-being and right now you know with the current pandemic crisis with everything that you know just the political climate you know just everything that's happened this year um it's you know students you know it's new what's going on is all crazy right and there's a lot of student needs and so i'm here to support our students whether that be provide them resources on campus or off campus social services <clears throat> financial aid, you know, helping them navigate that. Also scholarships, um, that's actually one of my, my main responsibilities is to oversee the scholarship process. And so scholarships are gonna be opening up for the College of Ed and actually for the entire university, but um, they're gonna be opening up in January and this is for the next academic year. Um, so come, you know, early January, I sent out an email and through the messaging portal that every student has access through, um i send out an email letting everyone know that the online application has gone live and we have over 30 scholarships in the college of education there this past year over ninety-five thousand dollars were was awarded to 72 students and so some students were able to pay their entire semester off it was incredible you can apply to more than one scholarship and you know i'm there to provide that guidance and assistance so you don't have to like overwork yourself because each one of those scholarships has their own requirements maybe there's an essay maybe perhaps there's letters of recommendation but i give you some points and recommendations and best practices so that way you don't have to you know just overwhelm yourself with it and so it's a doable process and i always highly encourage your students to to apply but it doesn't end there i support students like i mean there's some students who had some housing and food insecurities this year as well. And I was able to connect them with um, the resources that they needed for, their, for them and their families as well. So I always tell students, there's no, you know, please don't hesitate to ask me, you know, it, it, I'm, I don't know, I, I'm almost like a social worker for the college. I'm there to like, just find out what, what can I do for students and how I can support them because what affects them in their personal and professional life Will affect them in the classroom as well and i'm all about supporting the whole student not just what happens in the classroom but also making sure that you're successful in your personal life as well and so you know please you know feel free to come to to me i know that right now i'm not physically in my office but i am available and i'm very um accessible via zoom uh if you want to facetime or over the phone something informal doesn't have to be a formal zoom like this i understand that people are a little overwhelmed with zooming and all of that stuff but just know that my office is open to you and it's a safe space that you know if you have something of a confidential situation or nature to discuss that you can do that with me as well i meet with some students just to provide some mentorship or they need someone to talk to and they you know need you know a counseling referral or whatever it is i also deal with crisis management as well um, anytime there's a crisis issue in the college that is regarding one of our students i navigate that as well so it's almost like students see me for everything right um, navigating policy and procedures event planning um, leadership opportunities professional opportunities crisis issues everything that has to do with the student um that's that is that falls under my span of, uh, of care so um yeah and if if i can't for whatever reason provide that assistance i do try to find out who it is that i can connect the student to uh, that way they can get the assistance they need um i would say for me um and monique's position we are basically your guys's voice so whatever that you guys want done or you guys need to change and you're like hey becca or monique um i think this needs to be brought to the attention we go and we bring it to the board and to asi um and see if we can actually make a difference in whatever you guys 
are longing for for change, whether it's like a change for scholarships or something as simple as parking or just something about the College of Education just getting what they know can be more beneficial for you guys as future educators or whatever education route you're going through to um, become more successful in the college. And I also recommend, you know, getting, obviously, if you're not involved already, but getting involved in the clubs that our college has to offer because, again, it's, it's really important to get experience in that field and um, to gain that leadership experience to help you grow um, even more. Um, but that is all that I have. I feel like everyone else kind of hit the spot um, with other things. Um, also, um, since I just wanted to um, tack on with what Rebecca said as well. Um, since I've been the chair for about like two years now, I've seen some changes that the board of directors have done. So for example, um, just so an example so you guys understand how, what the board of directors can do. Um, last year, um, our prior board of directors um, in, I don't, I don't know if all of you have gone to um, the um, college park, so where College of Education is based on, um, but there is some food options there available to students. However, the, um, they do close at a certain time at 5 p.m., but this was pre-COVID obviously, but um, the board of directors advocated for the, um, for those food services to be opened up um, past 5 p.m. as some College of Education classes run past 5 p.m. So that was just to help um, College of Education students have that availability of food on campus late at night. So just um, something, um, just an example of what you guys can ask Rebecca and Monique to do as your, your, your advocates. Definitely, that is really good to know. And I will take advantage of that once classes are in session because my classes are after 5 p.m. So I think it really benefits uh, students like me and other um, graduate students who are taking night classes. And also funny thing you mentioned, uh, Yvette, you mentioned about funding. And you know, I came into uh, my grad program not knowing a thing about funding. And it's funny because I was assigned a project or a presentation on funding in higher education. So while it can be complicated, it can also be very beneficial for us. So I definitely recommend all of you students take advantage of that um, while those opportunities are available to you. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, what resources we can provide, but I wanna tackle a little bit about what are some of the current issues or challenges that your designated areas are facing during this time, you know, you know other than, the fact that we are going through a crazy time right now. I know that each of your different areas are uh, finding their best ways to uh, overcome those issues. Um, so one of the current issues that the Education Inter Club Council faces during that time is finding a way to connect and uh, network within the College of Education. So this is why um, this EICC panel is such a big thing in um, EICC history because this is the first time it's ever been done before to help reach out to students so students in the College of Education understand what the Education Interclub Council does for you all in the College of Education. Um, and um, an, another issue we have is trying to um, help students in the College of Education because not a lot of students in the College of Education um, know about um, our funding so we are able to help um, fund to help fund you to go to conferences and any event. So if you guys have any questions about whether your conference or your event that um, has a registration fee, you don't know if that goes under reimbursements, just send us an email. We'll try to find a way to um, help you with that. So um, one of the many challenges that I'm experiencing right now in my role is uh, the lack of, not lack of, but just, you know, there's less resources available. I feel like right when um, the pandemic hit in, back in March, when we went virtual, uh, switched from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual, there was a plethora of resources available. And so while my caseload um, went, I mean, skyrocket, skyrocketed, um, practically overnight where students were um, now facing, you know, health concerns, family um, health concerns, family layoffs, uh, personal layoffs, and 
just many different housing and, you know, just many, many different basic needs, um, insecurities. Um, there was the CARES Act that came through. There were many resources that there was funding still available. Sorry if you hear the dogs barking in the back. I have some fur babies. So, um, but I, you know, I had, it was almost like there was just a lot of resources available for our students. And so as time went on, as time has gone on, um, because a lot of those resources have been utilized, they've been in heavy demand, many of our, our, of our resources have kind of depleted a little bit. I'm working really hard with our development office to work with donors to get funding for emergency grants for our students, um, to get, you know, just more scholarships, to get more access to basic needs, um, you know, resources. And so that has been kind of my challenge in trying to connect students with resources is I've been just kind of working, kind of hustling, to be honest with you, with our local community. Um, and it's not just Orange County, because we have students that are from other counties, from Riverside, um, from the Inland Empire, from different parts of LA County, um, even out of state students, because we do have online programs. So it really requires for me to like hustle and work with food pantries from across the state and out of state to connect students with the local food pantry that can provide them the resources that they need. So it's just a lot of navigating, a lot of work, but it's meaningful work for me. And every time that a student gets what they need, I feel like, you know, I'm part, a little part of their student success and academic achievements. So um, those are some of the challenges. The, the resources are out there. I just have to dig a little harder and network a little bit more to get them. But I've been able to do that. It just, like I said, it's just taking um, as time goes on and there's less financial resources available. I'm having to, you know, ask um, work and partner more than before to be able to connect students to those resources, but they're out there. And so I tell students, please continue to come forward. Do not get discouraged. We are here to support you and here to provide that, you know, help that you need. Um, I think for me, this is more personal for me because I just kind of completed my training since I'm very new to this position. There was a little bit of a lack of communication on okay, what do I do next? Who do I meet with? Meet with? How can I like go out there and make an impact in my position? Uh, but I actually just met up with the chair with um, the chair of the board of directors, also with Monique to see like, okay, what's next? Who are the people that we need to meet with? Uh, and how can we make an impact when we're not sitting in on like the 10 meetings we go to <laughs> throughout the week? Um, so that was just challenging for me personally. Um, I know for Monique, she's been fighting um, for this position, our board of directors position, to be more accessible for grad students um, because there is a qualification where you have to be at Cal State Fullerton for a certain amount of years, and she wants it. She's fighting for like those people who didn't go to Cal State Fullerton but are first year grad students to be able to like have this position it, for it to be more accessible. Um, with the time slots, especially because our meetings are usually mid-afternoon to late afternoon. And that's kind of, you know, most of us who are student teaching or um, just in classes during that time, it's kind of hard for us to like make those meetings. So just more accessibility for this position for our grad students since our college is mostly grad students. Um, but yeah, and then for me coming into this position, I think something that um, I really want to do is also, because I am an undergrad student, really get our undergrad students who are enrolled in our education classes more involved in the college. Um, and so then we can lead them to go to our college <laughs> for the credential program and just, especially with everything being um, online and over Zoom and me being a fourth year, knowing that other people who are fourth years and graduating um, it might be difficult for like applying to the credential program or knowing what what's the next step and I think I would love to be like help that voice for the undergrad and then for our grad students as well to just um, push everyone to get more involved and for our college the College of Education to just get more recognition um, to be more involved in our college to really show that like 
yeah, we're awesome. <laughs> Look at us. <laughs> um, but yeah. Definitely. I, I agree with all of what you all said. Um, and I know this has been touched a bit already, but I think it's really important that we emphasize uh, that we all, including myself, are here to support our fellow students. Um, and so even during this time, I want to ask, what can students come to you uh, for? Um, and maybe this can include, like, what are common questions or support students are asking from you right now? And uh, for Diana, I want to ask if you see a difference in needs or support between undergrad and graduate students. Absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of our grad students do have families that they support. And I mean, we see that. I mean, as an undergrad student, you know, when I was doing my bachelor's degree, I paid bills. I worked three jobs to put myself through college. I had to pay rent and help my family. Um, so you do that at some level, you know, as an undergrad student, and we do have older undergraduate students who are parents as well. But um, we see that now at a larger capacity at our grad, in our grad programs. And so the number one question that I get a lot is scholarship information, finances. How can I, you know, pay for college? What resources, financial resources are there available? That's like number one. Um, and it almost seems like, you know, when I think through like what it is that I want to do as an assistant dean to enrich, you know, our program, you know, like high impact practices and co-curricular programming, our students are like, you know, please, please just show us what resources are available because that's really what we need right now. Our schedules are kind of overwhelmed right now with internships and student teaching and school and family and work a number of things what we really need are resources so I feel like that's like the theme um, that happens a lot and so if that is if that's if those are the needs then that's what I'm going to do um, that's what my focus is going to be and that's where I'm going to pour my energy is into you know navigating and finding out what resources resources are available social services are available for our students um, and just because you know I think um, when it comes to college campuses, and I've worked at multiple college campuses, both in public and private higher ed, I've noticed that there's always a strong undergraduate lens um, at every campus, regardless of how, you know, no matter how great they do, like what a great job they do supporting students, it's always undergraduate focus. So, you know, for example, operating hours of a center are from nine to five, you know, um, hello, like our students take classes in the evening, but maybe they're only available in the evening to like, you know, I'm working really hard to represent our graduate student population and making sure that, you know, there we are, we have a seat at the table that, you know, that our needs are being heard and that we are just actually, you know, that we exist in, at sometimes like, I have to remind, um, you know, different, um, you know, partners and different and different meetings. Like, hey, what about our graduate students? It's not accessible to them. Um, maybe let's record this Zoom meeting so that our students who have crazy schedules can access it. You know, um, can we, um, you know, extend the hours? You know, have weekend, you know, tutoring services available. You know, it's like I have to do that a lot. I have to fight for resources for our students. And, and it's not just this campus, it's all campuses because like I said, undergrads are usually the ones, that's that's the focus, right? Um, so that's been my, one of my main goals since the beginning, since I started here um, has been, it, that's, it's been, you know, expanding resources for graduate students. And, you know, it's, it's become a passion of mine to the point that that's what I'm going to write my dissertation on is the basic needs of graduate students and how when basic needs of graduate students are removed or they're threatened, how that affects retention and completion rates. Um, because it does. Um, if, if you have a sick child and you have a paper due, how the heck are you going to be able to focus, you're going to be on survival mode and that's not being able to utilize your brain and your energy in a correct way or you have bills to pay or you have, you're dealing with housing insecurities that you don't know how you're going to make ends meet. How can we expect you to be at your full potential and succeed in your classes if you are struggling to make ends meet? And that's the case for a lot of our graduate students. 
um, especially because a lot of our graduate students um, in the credential programs, for example, they're not allowed to work. And some of them come with mortgages already because they were, maybe they're married or, or they're, you know, they're living with partners and they've purchased, you know, a home and, or they have big rent, you know, I mean, all of us, right. We live in Southern California. It, it's expensive just to, to live here. And some have, you know, we have students who are dealing with housing insecurities where they're living in their cars and I'm, or they're renting um, a couch, you know, or you know a, a, a bed in someone's apartment like i'm sorry that to me is homelessness like i i'm not going to if i find out that one of our students is struggling like that i want to know because i want to address that and so um you know even something like that i've worked with our toughies basic needs center to find out like you know there's no housing emergency housing available during the summer well our students are in classes all year round so let's work something out here. What do I need to do to make sure that that's a resource that's available all year round so our students can utilize that if need be. So those are some of the, um, some of the things that our graduate students are dealing with. And like I said, it's usually financial aid, basic needs. Um, and you know, I, I really try to be intentional when I do have an event that it's resource-based that it's going to really you're going to get the return and investment you know if you attend that event you're going to take away something you're going to learn something new it's going to benefit you because i understand your your time is very limited as a graduate student and you know it's a sacrifice to be here like it is right now um and so i i really try to be intentional in everything that i do because i mean i was someone who like i said i worked through, during my undergrad and i worked also as well as i was already a director when i was doing my grad program married you know all that a lot of stuff going on and i struggled and i wasn't able to complete my grad program in, on time because of so many different responsibilities i had to manage that instead of completing it in two years it took me almost three years and i finished you know it's not a it's not a race the goal is to get there and finish and you know i learned to not you know um you know to i struggled with the imposter syndrome and i struggled with feeling less than but i fought that and you know i didn't let it beat me down and i got to the finish line and i'm here today you know so i'm here to you know i understand the needs and you know what's going on with our grad students because there there is a lot going on and i tell and i work with professors too so that's another thing is that <clears throat> if a student is having an issue with the faculty member where they're not being accommodating or understanding or supportive of what's happening in their personal life or right now, just everything that's happened in 2020, um, I'm an advocate. You know, I, I'm in a leadership position where I can go and speak to a faculty member one-on-one -on -one and know how to navigate that conversation to kind of bring to their attention like hello don't you see what's going on in the world you know like really um but do it in a professional manner and and have some authority as well can i add on to that okay um monique and i definitely um are you guys just again we're your guys's voice and we do have the power to bring that to the attention to the board of directors and we do have the power if it gets voted through to change anything so then you guys can have the resources that you need to succeed because it is not fair if you don't have like certain resources just because it doesn't fit within your time schedule because i i as someone who's about to get into the credential program because i'll be applying and i'll be um doing a credential program in the fall that stresses me out a lot too because i financially support myself and it stresses me out thinking about like how am i going to have time to have the certain resources i need to succeed and especially because a lot of the leadership positions within asi involve times that are like within when you student teach or um, something that isn't accessible to our students who are in our college and those leadership positions come with big scholarships that can definitely help support you and if you are passionate about leadership then that's something you can do but it should it should be accessible to all of our students and that's something that Monique and I can definitely bring to the table and just um, help fight for whatever you need fought for so 
Um, if you ever have any questions, you can always reach out to me. And if you ever have anything that needs to be brought to attention, you can reach out to me or Monique as well. Awesome. I, I just want to say, like, I am truly inspired by everyone's accomplishments, what you all are doing. I think a lot of people can agree that um, it's also very motivating to see that, you know, there's a lot of people that care about, you know, both undergrad and graduate students, and that we all want to see each other succeed, especially during this time. Uh, I do want to ask if there are some individual goals that you plan on uh, hoping to achieve this uh, as we progress into the school year, um, you know, I know we've heard a lot about accomplishments, but it's kind of like, a, what's next? Like, what's the next uh, challenge that you want to tackle? Um, one of um, the Education uh, Interclub Council's goals for um, this year is to try to find different ways we can help students in the College of Education as um, the Education Interclub Council does receive funding from ASI. We are trying to find new ways to help support students during this time. So for example, if you are um, in any of our clubs that um, are underneath the College of Education, we're trying to work with the clubs to see how we can use our funding for the clubs to help you all, for example, with either public speakers or um, oppor uh, opportunity drawings with gift cards, um, just so you guys have that um, little extra um, support. So one of my goals um, for this year, um, and the gosh, you know, like we have a holiday next week already, so it's the time is going by really quick. So, but it's to partner more with the AICC. A lot of the events that I put together, I do them by myself. Um, it's, I'm one office, one person in the office, you know, the assistant dean is, works um, on her own, you know, and so I really want to partner with the EICC and utilize them to put together more events for all of you. Like I said, resource type events. Um, and so, for example, like put together like a um, financial aid workshop specifically for credential students and have the EICC work with me on that. Um, have some kind of mental health, you know, wellness type of programming as well. Um, that's a big one for grad students. And I wanna make sure that, you know, that that whatever resources CAPS has available, can we narrow it down where it's for our credential and graduate students, you know, for our college specifically. You know, because I think that the resources are there, but they're more broad based and more general. I want to narrow it down to like make it more, um, you know, central for our college. Um, and so I also am really thinking, and I don't know how I'm going to do this, but incorporating the family somehow, you know, we all have chosen families and we all have, you know, um, people that are support, that, you know, our support systems that are everything to us. And so my goal actually this year, but of COVID screwed it up, was to have some kind of College of Ed Day of the Familia, where, you know, we were going to have like this big barbecue outdoors, you know, we we're going to get it catered and have a DJ and, you know, everyone invite, you know, their family members or partners and, you know, um, whoever it is that is your chosen support system to be there to meet your faculty members, you know, your, your, your professors, your, you know, your peers, you know, administrators, and just have a time of fellowship, you know, and that was the goal. And, and so I'm still trying to think like, okay, I don't want to give up on that um, because I think that it's really important that, you know, we somehow incorporate and, and, and acknowledge our family members, right? Our chosen families who have, who are supporting us, who have supported us along the way. I think that them getting acknowledged and um, for being there for us is really important. And I just, you know, I, I want to, that's a big goal for my mind. So I'll see how I make that work out during COVID-19 era. I don't know. Or maybe in the future when we're, you know, hopefully in person, we can do some big celebration. But um, there's a lot of big plans that I have. It's now just, you know, um, working alongside with the right partners and I have the EICC here to support me to make it happen. So those are, yeah, those are some of, some of the goals that, that I have for, for this position. Um, for me, 
I, um, going into this position now that I've like kind of gone through training and kind of caught up to speed with everything, um, I want to be able to make an impact and actually make a difference in this position to where I am doing something that someone says, thank you for doing that for me. Thank you for fighting for me. Thank you for making this change. This really helped me. I want to be able to do something, at least one thing in this position that does that. And I want to be, my pa I'm passionate about education and I'm very passionate about making a difference on my students' lives and um, just bettering the future of America <laughs> as a teacher. Um, and I want to be able to help everyone else do that too. And I, I want to be able to help equip these really strong future educators and people getting into that field of education, um, whether it's high, higher education, elementary school, uh, middle school, high school. And to do that, I need to be able to be your voice and your representative when there does, when there needs to be changes made. And when you need extra resources or when you need that help or when you need to be involved or you have questions about the credential program or how to apply or just about simply fighting for something like um, the College Park Food Place, just having, you know, access to food later, something like that. Um, just so then you guys are getting the full um, benefits that you need to be successful. So um, again, just continuing just to try to make a difference and an impact on this position to help benefit and help um, each of you guys grow as someone who's getting into the field of education. Uh, as well as still promoting, like just still fighting with social justice issues and just um, creating a very diverse and welcoming environment, a safe place for um, everyone is an also still a goal of mine. I think Cal State Fullerton really does an amazing job with that. And as someone who wants to teach history and as someone who is passionate about um, teaching different types of history and cultures, and making sure all of my students feel represented in the classroom. That's something I want to bring to the College of Education, just continuing doing that. Like we already have an amazing safe space, but just continue making sure that all students feel represented. Thank you. Um, I think with that, you know, I kind of want to uh, make sure that we get some information out for the rest of Education Week and what to expect. So, uh, Diana, if you could kind of share what we can expect for the rest of the week. Sure. So, tomorrow we have from 4:30 to 5:30. Sorry, I'm reading off my phone. Um, my notes here: Beyond Allyship, um, being an anti-racist co-conspirator panel. So that's actually open to the entire Cal State Fullerton community, and it's a public event. Um, so we're looking forward to having that tomorrow. And then Thursday, we have our Latinx teachers and uh, K through 12 education panel. So if you identify as a Latinx uh, member of the community and you would like to hear about, you know, teachers who are actually our alum who are out teaching in the community, you know, that event's going to happen on Thursday. And then all week long, we have our what it is our ed leadership and CBRO leadership symposium. So they've been posting, um, they've been uploading to their YouTube channel, um, you know, just different panels from student affairs to K through 12, um, alumni panels, uh, you know, professional panels, uh, student presentations and stuff. So that's available all week long. And that's all on our, you know, education week website um, in the College of Ed website as well. Awesome. I think someone mentioned uh, what time the anti-racist event tomorrow was. Oh, sorry. It's from, let me see, 4.30 to 5.30. Awesome. That's Zoom, of course. Okay. Got it. And I think with that, I, I truly thank our wonderful panel for their amazing and inspiring uh, responses. And if they could uh, share their contact information in the chat uh, so that uh, our fellow students can get access to that and know who to contact when they need further support. Um, I also would like to transition and take this time to transition really to our Q&A portion where you, uh, our audiences and students can ask uh, us any questions that you may have, anything that you, have been, um, that you had in your mind during this entire session. 
again, feel free to write them in the chat or unmute yourself to ask the question. So we do have one question, um, and I think this can apply to all of us. Uh, and Efren asks, how do you prevent burnout or how do you practice self-care during this time? I'd like to answer that question. You know, this is something that I've struggled with um, my entire, you know, academic and professional career. Um, you know, right now, I, I'll be, I'm going to be, so I'm going to be vulnerable. So I, you know, there's a lot going on in my personal life and just juggling that with, you know, everything our students are just struggling with and, and you know, I'm here supporting them with and, um, you know, school being, you know, doing a doctoral program and I have a toddler and my partner and he's active, he's a very active activist and educator. You know, we both have, I don't know, a hundred things going on at the same time. It is a time right now that we're feeling that burnout and um, I just started my grad program and I'm already burned out and I actually hit like a plateau where I couldn't write any longer and I'm like I just started like what the heck is happening to me um, and so you know I, I like to credit my partner with really he does a great job of taking care of himself he um, before COVID he used to go for massages all the time and you know just he does Brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo and he's a black belt in a number of martial arts. And what he's, you know, he's, he's a teacher and he works in a very high need community where there's a lot of challenges in the community. Um, his students are 50% foster youth and it's, you know, there's just a lot of his students are in the gangs, you know, they're gang related, but he loves them, you know, and he is like a mentor to a lot of them and he's very invested and um you know it does require a lot of time and a lot of energy and you know i asked him a while back like how is it that you are always like go 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 like you know you just seem like you don't burn out and he told me that when he does his brazilian jiu-jitsu whatever his martial arts he doesn't think about us. He doesn't even think about his son. He doesn't even think about me. It's the one hour where he really forgets about everything around him, including being a father, which is, I can't imagine that, like how hard that must be. But he said he's so into what he's doing that he's able to forget about his biggest worries and just focus on what he's doing. And he's able to mentally relax. I wish I could find whatever Brazilian jiu-jitsu you know, for me, you know, and he told me that find your Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, find whatever it is for you that whether it be like, I don't know, swimming or if it's, does it have to be some physical activity sport? It could be painting. It can be reading for fun. If you are an avid reader, it can be cooking. It can be whatever it is, um, going out for a walk, but find whatever Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is for you, where you're able to forget about everything. Like the world around you doesn't even exist. It's just you and whatever that activity or hobby is. And I'm still in that quest where I'm trying to figure that piece out for myself because I've tried multiple things and I haven't found something that's really able to take me out of, you know, worrying about my son or worrying about work or worrying about what the next essay it is that I need to research and write at a scholarly level, whatever the heck that means. I have to, you know, I'm always constantly worried about something and it's affected my sleep. I'm up till three in the morning and that's when I'm doing my writing and my research because I can't sleep because of COVID and whatever. So, you know, I, I am struggling a little bit with that, you know, self-care, but I know I'm well aware that I need to work on it and I'm going out for my walks and I'm doing whatever I can to fix it. Um, I am also trying not to pressure myself like I used to 
to be a perfectionist, to have to get straight A's or to have to, you know, like I'm aiming for it and I've been getting them, but I'm not also putting all that pressure on myself. Like, hey, I got a lot going on. We're living in unique circumstances with like COVID-19. There's racism, all kinds of craziness going on, you know, like this year. There's, you know, the, the elections. I mean, there's just all this craziness that's just driving me nuts that I can't, you know, expect myself to perform at a specific, like I used to before. So I've also kind of let that go, you know, and when people ask me, how's your day going? I say, well, how's my hour going? I'm not even taking it day to day anymore. It's how this hour is going because there's just so much going on that sometimes I can't worry about the whole day. I just need to focus on that one specific hour before moving on to the next thing. And I'm, you know, my studies, I'm taking it week by week. I'm not even trying to get ahead like I used to. I can't, I don't have the time. So I, I'm telling students, like I'm telling professors to, to be more understanding that right now is the time to extend grace and to be more patient and supportive than ever before we need to be a little bit more graceful towards one another and that is more real right now than ever before and so we need to do that for ourselves as well definitely i think it's very crucial uh to find your brazilian jiu-jitsu at this time um <laughs> yes but okay, so moving on to the next question. Um, I believe Caesar asked, and this is, I think, uh, what Yvette can answer. Can we be reimbursed for national conferences only? Um, you can be Im reimbursed for about any conference as long as it is um, teaching related or it's some um, type of information you can help bring back to the College of Education or um, just your education goals um, as long as um, it helps support you in your um, pursue. Um, sorry, I can't word right now, but as long as it helps, um, helps you uh, pursue um, your educational endeavors. But um, if you have any other questions, if you have a conference in mind, um, just send me an email and I'll do my best to um, try to find a way to reimburse you for that. <laughs> awesome. Um, so in the due to time, before I ask the last question, because I think this would be really uh, important information for everyone, um, I am going to provide a link. Uh, and this is an exit survey. Um, for everyone who is attending to fill out. And there is an opportunity drawing for those who do fill out. Uh, if you do have any issues, uh, please let me know. And with that, I want to close it out with this last question. And it was made by uh, Jeff. Uh, he asked if our, the recording from yesterday's event um, can be found. And I say that this uh, session is also being recorded how students who could not attend uh, can get access to that as well. Yes, all events um, this week are being recorded. And I think moving forward, any event that the College of Ed puts together will be recorded. I think for equity purposes, it's we should be doing that, you know, just so that way it's available for students um, when it's convenient, they can access it. But yes, I'm gonna be posting all the recordings at the end of the week on the Ed Week website underneath each event. Awesome. And I do see some people would like to take a picture so um if people people who know me know that i'm horrible at taking pictures or screenshots but i will do my best so it might take a couple takes be patient with me so if anyone wants to show their faces wow look at all your faces all right let's see how this goes oh my goodness everyone's faces are coming alive Everyone came out of hiding. Okay, I'm gonna take a picture in. Remember, it's gonna take a couple of takes. So, okay. One, two, three. All right, let me hope. Fingers crossed. Yes, I got it. Okay, so I will send that out uh, through the email that you are providing in the exit survey. That's why we're asking for that to get this screenshot. 
Um, but also, thank you everyone for attending this amazing session. If you want to stick around and ask any additional questions, feel free to. I'm sure our panel will stick around just a little bit uh, longer. Um, but also, again, thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see everyone at the other uh, events for Education Week and at future EIC uh, organized events as well.